This is Hack and Grow Rich, the podcast. My name is Bart Baggett. I'm the co-pilot in this conversation. It's really a conversation about your mind, money, wealth, finding true happiness. And the genius behind this podcast is the Amazon Mastery Course author and author of the book Billion, uh, Shaheen Shadden. Now, in this episode, we're going to talk about and take a deep dive into the concept of getting yourself unstuck at critical points in your life. I guess I call them inflection points, you know, crossroads in the desert, which way did you go? And you're in a real big treat tonight because not only do we have me and Shaheen, but we have a literally global acting superstar on our show, actor Darwin Shaw. Um, before we get to our great guest, Shaheen, just give me your 60-second overview about this idea of being unstuck. You made a post that we got a lot of engagement. People care about how you make these critical decisions. Yeah, look, I think especially now, and, and by the way, guys, Bart being the co-host here, uh, amazing success and motivational author, uh, successful on many levels, and uh, always, always honored to do the show with you, Bart. Uh, and uh, Darwin, Dr. Shaw, we will get into that. Welcome on the show. We will introduce you in a moment. So, yeah, I mean, look, I think especially now coming out of COVID, one of the things that I'm hearing a lot from people is that they just feel stuck, right? Maybe pre-COVID, they felt stuck in their lives, in their careers, in their you know relationships, whatever's going on. And now they feel even more stuck. Right. Maybe they were in a job and now they're working it from home and it's even more monotonous than that. I mean, for fuck's sake, we've been going through nearly two years of Groundhog's Day. Right. I didn't know for the last like six months which day was fucking Wednesday. I would wake up and be like, oh, my God, every day is the same. Right. We've all been stuck to our couches, stuck to our houses. And I am sure that people feel stuck. And I mean, I know from time to time, I do. I don't really feel that way anymore because I've got systems in place to kind of get around that. But I think this is going to be a really engaging conversation um, that's going to really, you know, take us to, you know, something about, you know, what happens when you feel stuck in life and, you know, what, what do you do, right? And, and, and more importantly, how do you make sure that you win when you have that kind of a feeling, you know? Sheena, I don't know that you can guarantee the outcome. If you're standing in a crossroads in the desert, both options look scary or both options look good. And I think both of us have had multiple careers. I think I have four right now that I can count as different businesses. And yeah, if one failed, the other one would pick up. But there was times in my life that it was all or nothing. It was red or black. And I had to make a decision. Do I move? Do I leave this woman? Do I not? And I think those are the critical pieces we're talking about, not just out of COVID, but what makes you thoroughly happy. And it leads right into our guest who, to me, uh, Darwin, you made one of the biggest decisions of your life and it, and it paid off. That's what's so incredible. So Shaheen, introduce our amazing guest and let's get down to some cool information about someone who really figured it out. Well, I think for our viewers, we got a little video and for you guys, we'll include a link to the show so you guys can see this. So this striking young man here is Dr. Darwin Shaw. And we will get down to why he goes by doctor or maybe does not anymore. So let's see. And so for you guys who are watching, I think I, I cut the audio on this. This is a scene from the James Bond film, Casino Royale. And we've got Daniel Craig kind of looking at Darwin with a menacing look, following him into a door. And there goes Darwin. I think there's a game of, is that cricket or rugby? One, one or the other. And uh, Darwin's running up the stairs. Daniel Craig is staring at him. And this is actually such an awesome scene. He runs into a locker room, knocks a guy down. And now, now he pulls out a gun and there we go. And now he's got a gun and Daniel Craig, there he is, James Bond. Wow. Wow. And there is Darwin getting pushed into a bathroom stall and getting punched in the face. Oh no. looks like he almost got a choke on Daniel Craig and nope. You, you just can't beat James Bond. I knew this wasn't going to go well. And that is... I think one of the scenes that really ignited uh, Darwin's career. Um, Darwin Shaw, 
Welcome to the show, bud. You got to unmute yourself. There we go. And welcome to the show. Honor to have you on. Thank you so much for having me, guys. So, so tell us about this scene. This is your first big acting break, and you get the first scene of the new James Bond, and you get killed. That's the cool way to start a career. Yeah, I, I think my a lot of my early <laughs> early work ended up being killed in different ways. Um, so the game was always like, how long into the movie could I get before I died? And I think uh, Bond was, I think I was dead within six minutes. I think I, I eventually got to like 26 minutes. <laughs> wow. What's it, what's it feel like to, you know, be starting? I mean, and we'll go into your history, but what's it feel like to kind of have humble beginnings, you know, come from a normal family life, you know, um, and then all of a sudden one day wake up and you are on the set with Daniel Craig, James Bond himself as the lead bad guy in Casino Royale. Well, I wasn't really the lead bad guy, but I was definitely the, the first kill. I was the sort of the introduction scene to James Bond. Um, it was it was surreal. I mean, you you work. I mean, anyone who's who's involved in the creative world knows, and probably the same in, with entrepreneurs like yourself. You put in a lot of work, and you never know where it's going to pay off. And you know, acting is a very personal thing because you're putting yourself. You know, if, if people don't like you, it's not because your product sucks or because, you know, you, you your thing doesn't work properly. It's very personal. Um, so when you get this opportunity, I mean, I was, I was, it was quite early on in my career. So I didn't know then what I know now, which is what a privilege it was. I mean, I knew it was an amazing thing. Um, but after, you know, 15 years later of going through all the journey as an actor, I look back and you know, it's mind blowing that you can just suddenly step out of drama school and within a year and a half, you're, you know, in Prague in the snow working with stunt guys and uh, suddenly a hundred people around you, they hand you a gun and all the training that you've done for the past month suddenly has to be spot on in that next, you know, three hours. Yeah, I know, I know that you're a, a very dedicated person. I know you and me have been friends for many years. And I remember early Darwin Shaw when you went by your former name and, you know, you were staying at my house in Venice and, you know, just living the, the young actor life. But let's let's roll back even a little bit more from there before you were in James Bond before you got that amazing role in Prince of Persia, before you had one of the starring roles in the Bible, before all these great hits, before House of Cards that you were in with uh, Robin Penn and, you know, really crushed that, by the way. But um, so before all that, I understand you went to medical school. Yeah, so uh, I grew up in a in a northern city. Leeds, uh, a great town in the north of England, and got admission to, to London, to King's College, and I spent um, seven years training as a doctor and uh, start and worked um, actually for a few years before I had this very big life change and, and you know, completely changed career. What, what happened? I mean, were you like, you, presumably you did a lot of schooling. Right. And I, I know that you're half Pakistani by origin and half British. And if Pakistani parents are anything like Persian parents, that is the highest level of achievement is becoming a doctor or a lawyer. But doctor is higher. Right. Because then you're going to get all the good wife. You're going to get all the good ever. You're going to be you, you. You have brought honor to your family. Well, I mean, I think that was definitely in the, on some level, but um, I don't know, my, my grandfather, my, on my mother's side, he was supposed to be a doctor and he became a priest instead. And on my father's side, I did have some sort of alternative medical doctors in, in my family. Um, but for me, I'd, I'd always wanted to make a difference. And I, you know, I it felt, you know, I came from a very sort of you know, socially orientated family. My mother was a teacher my, and a social worker. My dad was a teacher, worked in, with the special needs kids. And we also ran a, a family newspaper, which was uh, like a community newspaper. So we were very involved with, with trying to make a difference. So 
it was very natural for me to to fall into that sort of caring role um and you know i was fortunate enough to have that great opportunity the the educational system in england allows that to happen um you know you you don't have to go bankrupt in order to go to university um and you know i was, I was very privileged to have that education and and to in that training um but okay so you got that education you got that training you did all that stuff and then you were like i'm out guys i'm gonna go and uh do the least you went from the most secure most respected job to i mean i think the only thing that could have been less than telling a uh you know a parent from you know a culture like like ours would be you know i don't know that you're going to be an artist or a ballerina something like i think those two would be the only two things lower right bart <laughs> i mean if status was something that really drives you Darren, I had a friend who who went went that route. She was an attorney. She made tons of money, and at 33, she went, "I can't do it anymore. I can't work 18 hours. I need a social life. I'm miserable." She quit everything and just started buying up real estate. So she just made a huge left turn. But at 33, what age did you decide that this just wasn't your path? And how did you find that making a difference was still part of that equation as an actor? Well, I think one of the things which is very important to me is representation. Um, I think when I was growing up, there was no one who looked like me on, on screen. And I found a lot of, of kids who sort of would sort of be following people who were not from their culture and falling into bad ways because there was no one who they could aspire to. So I, I felt there was a, you know, I, I, I hoped that there was something which I could bring to the, to the film industry, which would be something which would, which, you know, young people would be able to see and, and aspire to because I never had that. I only I only knew, you know, the Roger Moores and the and the Connerys and you know they're wonderful, wonderful actors. But it for me I, I felt there was a significant potential that I might be able to fill. I and mean, you know, I still don't think I, I've achieved that boom. But I've been part of the movement and there have been many wonderful actors out there who have done that. Yeah, I mean look, I think go ahead, Bart. I was just wondering, how, how do you walk away from security? Because as a doctor, you're making money. You're, you're obviously very busy. And the odds of you making it in Hollywood are you know, somewhere with zero to, to one in a million. What, what is that? Th take me back. How did you make that decision? Did you consult your buddies? Did you consult your parents? Like, that's a huge turn. Well, I've been also, um, I had a bunch of friends who were musicians. And I I discovered that, that people were able to, live a humble life and really get fulfillment from it. And um, I was given a book called The Artist's Way by Julia Cameron and uh, by a poet friend of mine. And um, she, I decided to have a, I had a six month period where I was uh, at a sabbatical essentially. And I decided to go to New York and she told me to read this book. And it was through following this, this book that I, I sort of fell into an acting class and the experience of being in that class was, you know, was was with my my first coach, Bruce Ornstein, and it wasn't a choice. You know, I just knew this was something I had to had to uh, involve myself in. Not that I was any good at it. I mean, I, I, it was not about being good, but it was the feeling. The feeling I, I felt a thrill and an excitement about it. And I didn't think it was going to be a career. I just was like, I have to do this now. Um, and I started to do it and like, you know, anything, you know, I think many, the good thing about medicine is it teaches you how to have faith in yourself. So when I trained, it was quite a while ago, um, but we had this philosophy, which was see one, do one, teach one. So literally you would watch a procedure being done and then you'd probably do it once with supervision. And then they'd send you off to do it yourself if you felt comfortable. Um, so I did some pretty, pretty wild stuff very early on because I was kind of really into that idea of just getting in there and I was quite good at my hands. So I was, you know, I'd go and do surgical procedures with only a small amount of, of sort of official training. But what it did is you, you learn to trust yourself. You learn to really pay attention, really listen to people. Um, if you mess up, 
you know, it's a, it has huge consequences. So there's a certain humility which comes with that. And I think when I started acting, it was the same. It's like, I'm just going to listen to you guys. Like, you tell me something, I'll try and learn it. Um, and that was one of the ways, I think, which certainly helped me because I wouldn't say I was naturally the most adept actor. You know, it's not like some of these people who had just been born on stage, you know, and from the family. So, it's, you know, I had to shed my medical, my medical, uh, you know. Your medical so, background. Yeah, well, the scaffolding which had created me a good doctor was when, if I was in a situation where shit was going down, when people were sick, when blood was spurting everywhere, when police were there with guns because a gunshot had come in and people were breaking down in tears, dying, whatever, I would just have to not be emotionally connected to it. I just have to be like, okay, tell me the thing. Okay. Acting is the opposite. If someone pinches you, you've got to jump. I trained myself through medicine to get rid of that sort of reaction. It's like, you could be depressed, tell me how suicidal you are. And I have to have empathy and have to have kindness, but I can't, if I start crying, you know, I wouldn't be, you know, it's, people want empathy, but they don't want someone to, to fall down. And I think that was an interesting change when I, when I came back from America and I realized I was going to do both for a while until I, until my, I went to drama school was this kind of change of, of learning to be more emotional. And then what happened was I was in the ER and things were happening and I started to feel again. And that was a very uncomfortable situation to be in because it was a very big change. And it was that point where I realized, you know what? I'm going to commit to doing this for a while. I'm just going to say goodbye to medicine. I'm going to throw myself in and become an actor. So as an actor, when you're on the set with someone like Robin Wright or Daniel Craig or on the set of Prince of Persia, one of these shows, do you ever feel, I know you're not, but do you ever feel like you're a fraud? Do you ever feel like you're an imposter? Like, is that, is that a feeling that you've ever had on the set? For, I mean, I think feeling a fraud is common to, to, to a lot of successful people. And for me, it's not so much being on set, it's the beforehand. You know, I think once I've been on set, I've already gone through the auditioning process and someone's given me the thumbs up and they said, we trust you. And then I'm fine. I'm much worse when it comes to the auditioning process because I feel like I'm still having to show myself and prove myself. And that's when all the psychological sort of, you know, you know, where you suddenly think, I'm not that good or this, you know, I, I'm, I'm really this guy. I'm really a doctor to an actor, not the, the person who is, you know, the warrior or the, you know, the drug dealer or whatever that thing is. Yeah, that makes sense. So it's the, it's the validation that you've already been, you've already had the validation once, once you get approved. Okay. So the show is called Hack and Grow Rich. And we like to give people practical takeaways that they can use. Um, so let's, let's move on to, let's do like three practical takeaways. So, you know, earlier you and I talked about kind of the concept of, you know, Napoleon burning his ships, right? Um, so for, uh, you know, and, and we can go back and forth. I know Bart's got a couple questions too, but so from the standpoint of somebody who is stuck in life, let's say somebody who's younger and, and they're looking at you and going, man, you made it, right? You like... You lived the dream. You became a doctor. You did surgery. And we're not talking chiropractor. We're not talking, you know, woo-woo doctor. We're not talking PhD. We're talking you became a medical doctor cutting into people. And you moved from that because there was some part of you that felt driven to being an actor and you made it. For somebody who is feeling stuck in life or is feeling, uh, uh, as they say in the film, The Matrix, a splinter in their mind, wishing that, or, or I should say, feeling that something is missing and that there's something else that they may be drawn to. How do they, how would you tell somebody, let's say somebody, you know, possibly younger than you, the younger you, how would you tell them to pursue that? And how do they know when it's reasonable to take the risk and, and burn their ships or if they should burn their ships. 
I mean, I think you shouldn't burn your ships for no reason, but I think for me, the important thing is finding something which moves your soul, something which feel, you know, it, I think if it's, if it's about, you know, a lot of the people I know who are extremely wealthy, they're not necessarily wealthy because they want to get rich. They actually love what they're doing. It's a kind of, the, the money side of things is some ways like a byproduct of doing it. I mean, that's the game. The game is to be successful, but they're not doing it because they really want a Porsche or a Lamborghini. They just kind of love what they're doing. And I think that's the love of what you're doing is, is crucial and it doesn't matter what it is. Um, for me, it's been acting and I don't think I'll ever lose that love, but I, I've also been directing and writing and producing as well. And I think the, I think once you, if you know what you want to do, for me, it was about burning the bridges in a way. I mean, it was like sinking the ships. I might, I might have still got a, a nice little rope holding it. I could probably like tug it back if I spent a few years retraining, but I, I, I mean, I'm quite an all nothing person. So like, if I do something, I'm just going to throw myself into it. And I think, that's the only way of, of for me to be to be successful. Um, but the important thing I learned is that to bring creativity into your life can only be a, it can be a small thing, but that can bring you great, great, great joy. Um, or you can do you know you, you have to find out what's right for you. But to be more to be creative and creative in your life, I think is a is a true a true path to happiness. Mm. Yeah. Creativity is a, is a big deal. Okay. Um, so another thing that we talked about, and then I'll, I'll turn it over to Bart cause I know he's itching to ask you a question. Um, and then we want to talk about what you're doing now. Cause I know you're doing some really cool stuff now too. Um, so my question is this, so someone told me that every person you meet teaches you something. What did you learn from your first big role from Daniel Craig? Was there a lesson there that you might never forget? Well, I think from, I mean, I had such a small part in that film, but what was amazing was, was the humility of, of Mr. Craig. Um, he was incredibly kind, generous. I was a baby actor, really. I'd, I'd done, you know, very little. And, you know, he, he had a big career, even though he might be, not have been world renowned as he is now, He'd had a big career. He did a lot of theater. He'd uh, done a bunch of, of movies and was brilliant in them. And he was just, you know, he was quiet, humble, and very generous to me. And uh, at the end of the shoot, he actually got me a car and a bottle of wine and, and said, no hard feelings, Daniel. And, you know, he didn't need to do that. I was, I was essentially a, you know, a fight scene. And you know, that, that that kind of says what sort of kind of person he is and it really made me think well it doesn't matter where you are if you can keep that sort of kindness and, and, and enthusiasm I mean it really you know it, it spurred me on I just you know and it gave a great blueprint of of how you should be as a leader mm. right I mean humility is amazing Bart I know you go to India a lot and as part of eastern culture you know, we're immersed in humility, but like in LA, I remember like looking around and, and Darwin, you and me have talked about this too. Um, you know, people just don't have that humility anymore. It's not something that's shown on Instagram or TikTok or, you know, these channels where they're trying to make as much noise as they can. It's all about my Lamborghini and my, you know, look at my big house and look at these girls in the jacuzzi and, you know, like all that kind of stuff. But, you know, is it, hum, humility is so important, wouldn't you say, Bart? Well, I, I mean, I've, I do a lot of business in Australia and a lot of friends, and they're always talking about the tall poppy syndrome and how I can't sell like a gross American. Like, it's not just India. It's that the whole world doesn't really appreciate this sort of, you know, infomercial uh, essence. Um, but, but it is humility. But I wanted to ask you a question, Darwin. And, and I, I've been on a few movie sets myself, so I have a little bit of background in what you've been doing. Is... Do you think, and I know, I, I perceive that you still feel like you have a lot more to accomplish 
in, in the film business. Like I, I feel like you're like, hey, I'm here because I was pretty. I feel like you're just like, hey, man, I'm still grinding it out. That's my that's my intuition. Am I correct on that? Absolutely, yeah. Um, and, and so, given that you've had a significant level of success and you've been around these amazing actors, what would you say the key skill set is for them to continue working? Because remember, if you those guys don't know, if you're not outside Hollywood, it's not one or two movies. It's a career. It's 20 mm -hmm. or 30 years, and maybe or maybe not ever getting on the stage with the Oscars. But what's the key critical skill? Is it relationships, or is it skill, or is it something else that I haven't mentioned? Well, acting is such an, a weird, I mean, to even call it a career is, is, is kind of giving it a, a word which doesn't really link to it because you can be the height of your profession and you can disappear. Um, you can be earning, you know, in America, millions and millions of dollars and then suddenly, for no apparent reason, not be working for several years. And the, the psychological... Uh, challenges is really real i mean not only on the financial sense but you get used to being treated a certain way and then you just not you haven't got it and that, then you're coming back as a small time actor again even though you've done big stuff so i i think resilience is is you know and, and within that it has to be to to be your own best friend i think you know a lot of a lot of our career involves external validation and it's very difficult and i can't say that I've, I've ever achieved it properly but you have to trust yourself and believe in yourself not to the expense of stupidity but you have to you have to have a certain amount of of broad shoulders and and, and that's why i come back to the thing is you have to love what you're doing because if you don't, you're just going to be looking outside yourself to know whether you're whether you're good enough or you're you're doing well enough, and that's that will drive you crazy. Great answer, great answer. Yeah, I like that. I like that. Or as as Bart would say, if you don't do things right, you'll go tits up. <laughs> <laughs> he said that, that like three shows ago, right? We, we had to we had to look that up, and um, <laughs> it's kind of become a. It's, it's, a quick story, Darwin. I, I, like I said, I've, I used to audition and had been in a few films myself. I uh, had this audition a couple of years ago, and I just thought I nailed it. Like I was prepared. I hired an acting coach. And I was. This is a really cool movie, and um, ended up going to Matthew McConaughey's brother, who who's a fine actor. And I didn't know this until a year later. But I was just like so crushed because I really was like. I nailed the Texas accent. I did all, you know, I just, and, and and I and I bounce back, and I'm still auditioning, and, and I'm never, I'm not near as successful as you are. But my question is, is that the point? You've got to be resilient, and you've got to continue to get on the horse and enjoy the process, because the process of writing comedy, of doing podcasts, of acting, I really love the process, and I don't mm. really care if I ever get famous, because I enjoy the process. Is that sort of what you're saying is in those moments when you get bummed out, you got to go back because it's fun? Because if it's not fun, you're not going to hang in there when you get rejected. Yeah, I mean, I think at a certain point, there's a balance between, you know, how much input you put in and how much output you get. Um, I think that I think that you have to love the process. I mean, especially, I mean, I come from a theatre background and it's in England, you don't get paid much. So you have to really love it. You know, there's not this kind of idea that you're going to have this big golden hanging shake at the end of, end of it. It's like, even if you're Judy Dench, you know, you're earning, you know, if you're doing theatre, you're earning like a what you know, road sweeper might get in some countries. You know, wow. it's not, it's, it's not, it's not big bucks. But if you love it, if you love the process, you know, and I, you know, I, I certainly do. My, my, you know, and, and that's why, you know, going into producing and making my own stuff. It is an extension of that. It's it's different from being on on the on the other side of the camera, but you know I, I now have an opportunity to also um, give other people the opportunity to to have that experience, which is really fulfilling too. Yeah, let's let's talk a little bit about that now. So I know you have, um, you know, branched out from just acting to also being a writer, a director, a producer. I know you you've always been um a renaissance man a, a jack of of many trades what are you working on now and how can we learn more about it 
So the since um, the pandemic hit, I'd already written a movie which I was going to take out to try and to finance to direct, and obviously that was not going to happen. So me and my friend came together and we put together this idea called the Antiviral Film Project. And this is an anthology of 24 short segment and um, you know narrative stories set on the backdrop of COVID, but in different countries around the world. And what we're doing is we're reaching into the talent all over the world, finding writers, pairing them up with directors and musicians to make these stories, which will all interlink together and end up being this one huge piece, which takes us on a journey around the world of these inspiring stories. Wow. And so what's the last one that you shot? Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, the, it was actually the first of the of, of our whole anthology is called Carl and the Janitor, and it's going to be released internationally in a couple of weeks. Um, and it's the story and the unlikely friendship between a young boy and an older janitor um, who are both really happy about lockdown because the janitor can get on with all his work in the school and the young boy has some social challenges and he doesn't like being around other kids and there's this friendship and you know he's he's obsessed by space and it's just this beautiful moment in their lives because he's never it's, a, it's their farewell um and it's a very touching story of the friendship really um and then from that one we're going to jump to south africa and we're going to the amakala game reserve and we're doing a story called the last ranger and this is about the game reserve, once tourism stopped, lost all their financial um, in income. So they couldn't pay for their rangers to protect the rhinos. Oh. And at the same time, local people didn't have any money. So the, the incentive to be, to be picked up as a poacher becomes greater. So it's this moment, it's a story about these two things collided. This one, uh, one last ranger protecting the rhino against the against the poachers um, and you have that on film so yeah we, we're going to shoot it in in august and we have access to this wonderful reserve and uh you know we're commencing casting in south africa in let me ask the question that's on bart's mind right now and as a medical doctor can you confirm that rhino penis does not give you more erections right now <laughs> i can confirm that a rhino horn has got the same composition as your fingernails and your hair and it will do nothing below the waist why do they do that yeah we're gonna have to throw out cases and cases of pills for shaheen now what, <laughs> what are we gonna do with no more rhino is that where they call it rhinoplasty that's the nose right is it the rhino <laughs> yeah exactly. what why do they do that why i'm like leave the freaking rhinos and the, the pangolins and like all the why why like You've got Viagra, people. It's a drug. <laughs> it works. Like you buy it, it's like fifty cents in the third world. Like, why do you have to have the horn that looks like a horn? Why are people so foolish? People are very, very uh, misguided. Don't it sound but like all your movies have a, a either a public service message? or you're actually donating to these causes. It, did you pick those strips because you you just cared and they moved you, or is there like a nonprofit behind this? And is there anything that we can help you promote as we kind of talk about these these three films or more that you're putting together? Yeah, thank you. Um, well, what we've the way we're financing this whole project is, is through, there's a new startup called Bingeable, which is exhibiting our films online. And we're splitting the proceeds the gross revenue between Doctors Without Borders, who's the charity that we support internationally, and the second, the other half of the money will go to pay for the next film. So we're having sort of a, a sort of a, a pay it forward model where filmmakers in one country, so in Denmark, will support the filmmakers in South Africa, and then they'll both support the next country, and so on. But we're going to be doing a big fundraiser to try and kickstart the the financing for the next film on the fifteenth of July in Los Angeles. And we also have a, a 501 uh, 3C um, charity, which is tax free, which you can donate to on our website, which is uh, antiviralpictures.com. Um, 
and you can you know you can follow us on the antiviral film project and see the trailer and you know we the link to the first film which you can purchase for a donation um is on the Médecins Sans Frontières, the MSF Denmark website, and then it will be also internationally again in a couple of weeks. Amazing. Yeah. And we'll uh, add all of, please send me all of those links um, and we will include them in the, in the show notes for uh, people that are watching. And if people want to follow you, Darwin, and join the Darwin Shaw fan club and your, do they follow you on Insta? How, how do people? Yeah, at, at Darwinius on Instagram. Um or you can find me through the Antiviral Film Project as well. Both, both of them. Now you're you're a good looking guy. Have you ever? I I know you date starlets and you're always on the red carpet and that kind of stuff. Have you ever had a stalker? Do you know what? I have had a stalker. Wow. It's very you're scary. Not, you're not anybody in Hollywood has had your first stalker. I think that everyone <laughs> yeah. knows that rule. I had this stalker, and literally every photo that they could find of me on the internet, they'd superimpose their head really badly <laughs> on, the, on the picture. So it was going to be walking down the red carpet with like some body with this woman's head on it. And uh, it got a bit much when she started contacting other people I know. It's, it's, yeah. It's, okay. It's not good. We're not gonna. We're not gonna send. Don't do that, That's people. The Don't do it. Nobody you. likes it. <laughs> That's the weirdest question you've ever asked. <laughs> okay, cool. Then I'm doing something right. <laughs> that the rhino penis and the other. Wait, do they, is it just the horn, or do they actually like hunt the penis too? No, they, they don't care about that. It's just just the horn. Just the. But it would make more sense. So the penis just goes to waste, right? There's not rhino really penis. Science. <laughs> not really scientific. It's just yeah. bad it's, stuff, guys. Don't kill rhinos. Don't kill these wild animals, please. Don't kill elephants. Don't kill. There's no need. There's no need. There's no need. All right, Dr. Shah, can they? They can follow you on Insta. We'll include that note. Um, is there a fan club currently? No. no okay. No, no. We'll have. To, we'll have Instagram to... page. That's that's the current day's fan club. Instagram yeah. page. I don't, you fan can't club. Do, does anyone's? Do they still exist? Probably with Kiss because they love money, but the rest of the world, no, not really. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, really appreciate you coming on the show and, and great to see you and sharing your time with us. I know how busy you are and we'll, we'll be looking for you on TV, on film and online and uh, inviting everybody to take a look at your new, it's a really awesome project, you guys, antiviral films. Um, we'll be looking at that. So, so get involved, reach out to them. And uh, Bart, how about you? If people want to learn more about you, and I don't know if uh, you know, we want to get uh, uh, maybe one of your books for free. Is there a way we might be able to do that? Yeah, yeah. I put up a website after you told me that might as well just give it away at uh, getbartsbook.com. Uh, and it, it is just free. It's a PDF. It's got some videos. The audiobook's coming out. And that's called The Magic Question. My Instagram, which I think is my fan club, is at bartbaggett.com, B-A-G-G-E-T-T. -T. Um, and so, yeah, reach out to me those directly if you want to grab a book. Uh, Darwin, hopefully I can see you at your event in L.A. I can't wait to meet you in person. I love you. Shaheen, I, think, I, I love that. And, and Shaheen, I believe you have a, an Amazon course, and then you've got a book coming out as well in the coming months. Yeah, so check out the podcast for that, guys. My book will be coming out in the next couple months. I'm just recording the audio book now. Bart, thank you for those tips. That the clap changed my life. My editor is sending me love notes now because he's <laughs> like, he's like, oh my god, he's like that. Nobody does that. That's a game changer. The poor guy's having to edit all this reading audio. So thank you. It's you know, you know, guys, having friends that are that are such consummate professionals really makes a difference. And that's something about both of you guys, both Darwin and Bart, is that you guys, you know, it doesn't matter what you do, no matter how big or how small, you always bring excellence to what you do. You are competent, you are creative, and you do it with the same level of excellence as if you were being paid hundreds of thousands of dollars that I know you both get paid for, for what you do, or if, or if they're not paying you at all and you're just doing it for charity or you're doing it for your, one of your creative passions, you guys bring that excellence. And I think that's something that you both have in common. So um, really honored to know you guys. Um, guys, check out The Billion, How I Became King of the Thrill Pill Cult podcast. The first episode is up. You can get that on Spotify, uh, Stitcher, Apple Podcasts, Amazon Podcasts, anywhere podcasts are found. 
um, Hack and Grow Rich. We've got a YouTube channel that's live right now. So you can check out, check us out on YouTube or also on Spotify, Amazon, Apple Podcasts, anywhere like that. And if you're interested in creating predictable recurring revenue through selling on the Amazon platform, I've got a free one hour course I'm happy to share with all the listeners. Um, I respond to every single email personally. It might take me a minute to get back to you, but reach out on shaheenshan.com um, or you can check it out on fbasellercourse.com. All those links are going to be on the show notes. And thank you guys so much. What a, what a treat uh, this show has been. So, so honored to have both you guys, uh, both you guys on and thanks for being on and we'll see you guys on the next episode where we're going to have more.